Hi, I'm Judy Godier, and I designed this quilt. It's called Roaring Twenties, and I designed it so that we could showcase the peppered cottons that are from Studio E Fabrics. Studio E Fabrics has lots of different colors of these peppered cottons, and these are just the newest colors that Pepper has come out with. With this video, I am going to talk about how to do block number four. Block number four has a beautiful Art Deco design. And it kind of looks like a flower. I love it. There is some components that can be done as lap quilting, and there are components that can be done on your sewing machine. So watch and we're gonna talk about how to do block four. In a prior video, we discussed taping PDF patterns together that have been printed on your home printer. There are some unique concepts with block four that we need to discuss that are similar but not the same to the discussion that we had about downloading PDF patterns. I want to make sure that people understand that these are very large circles that are going to be appliqued onto the block. The largest circle is 12 and a half inches in diameter. So you understand that if it's 12 and a half inches in diameter, you will not be able to print it on an eight and a half by 11 inch sheet of paper. Therefore, I am going to walk you through what you're going to need to do to download this and to print it. The next largest circle, the medium circle for block four is also going to need to extend beyond one sheet of eight and a half by 11 inch paper. This is downloaded in such a way, it's set up for you so that when you download it, both of these print and they will print in a poster format. And I'm going to show you how to do that. The other circles for this quilt are smaller circles. They are accommodated by an eight and a half by 11 inch sheet of paper. This is key. The one inch square for scale, that's key. When you are determining whether this uh, circle is the right size, if you measure the one inch square, if it's one inch by one inch, you've got the correct size. The same applies for the templates of the shapes that are in this block. This square needs to be one inch by one inch. And then you will know that your templates are the correct size. These are all provided in the PDF downloads. They're all there. You have to just be thorough and scroll through and take a look at what belongs to what, all right? There's some smaller pieces as well that are, you're going to check that they are one inch square for scale. This block has these components that are done by English paper piecing. And I'm gonna show you a way that they can be done using the sewing machine and also using English paper piecing. And it has a small, medium, and a large circle. And these templates are all included in the PDF download. And we're gonna talk about how to access all this. If all else fails and you're still having trouble printing these, you can take them to Kinko's or Staples or one of those places that will do this for you and take your computer down there and they'll know how to do it. But if all else fails, the medium circle is a nine and a half inch diameter circle. So you could find a compass and draw a nine and a half inch circle in diameter. And this one is 12 and a half inch, 12 and a half inches in diameter. So you could certainly draw a circle that is 12 and a half inches in diameter. Okay, so now let's talk about the pattern pieces. You'll have a basic color diagram of the block. You can choose to print this out if you would like, or you can work with your tablet next to you, or you can work with your computer open next to you. If you don't feel like printing this out in full color, which can be expensive, you can do it that way. You will also have just regular templates as well in the PDF download. 
and these look like this. Now again, pay attention to the one inch square for scale. Now these templates can be accommodated on an eight and a half by 11 inch sheet of paper. You want to look where I have it circled up above that you are printing it at 100%. You also want to look at the page number. When you are scrolling through a document that is a PDF download, it will tell you the number of pages and it will tell you which page you are currently on. Pay attention to that as well because you are going to want to print these pages on regular eight and a half by 11 inch paper. You will click the print uh, icon in the upper left corner and you will print the pages that you want. At this point, you don't want those large circles yet. You're not going to print those because those have to be printed differently because they're going to be much, much larger. Then you will have the small circle and the medium circle. And these two circles that are for applique also can be accommodated by an eight and a half by 11 inch sheet of paper. Look at your one inch square for scale once it's printed. Make sure that it measures one inch by one inch once it's printed. And look up there at that page number. Make sure you're printing that page at 100%. Then move over to your print icon in the left side and then print it like you would any other document. This one gets printed at 100% like all the other ones do and pay attention to your page that you are printing that page of circles. Okay, now we've come to a circle that on this page says to enlarge to 200%. You must enlarge this to 200%. Up at the top, where it says 100% where I have it circled, that's where you're going to hit that um, scroll down menu um, arrow and you're going to choose 200%. Okay, that's going to totally change the look of your document. You're going to note the page number and note that's the page and the pages that are after that because those are multiple pages. This has to get printed on multiple pages because it is too large to accommodate an eight by, it be accommodated by eight and a half by 11 inch sheet of paper. So you're going to change that little number with the drop down menu bar to 200%. And this is how it will look. Once it's enlarged to 200%, you can see that it's off the page, right? But there will be subsequent pages that come after that, that it will be on. And when you scroll, through your document, you'll see that it's divided up onto other pa pages. So it, you'll see on the top where I've circled that there are multiple pages that are yet to come. And when you click print, you're going to want to print this differently than you printed just the little templates. You're going to want to print this as poster, not as regular paper, but you're going to click poster because that's going to spread it out over a number of sheets of paper that you will then overlap and tape together. This is the spot on the dialog box that will pop up when you click print and there is where you choose poster. Prior to choosing poster, it's going to look like those two circles crammed into the page. But once you choose poster, Once you choose poster, it's going to show you in that dialog box that it's going to divide it up over six sheets of paper. And that's what you want. You want to print those six sheets of paper and you will see at the top what pages those pages are at the top of the PDF document. This might sound like a lot, or maybe you're a pro and you already know how to do all this. If you don't want to deal with all of this, you will um, be able just to take it to Staples or Kinko's or something like that. Um, if you play around with it and you waste some paper in the process, great, you're learning something. 
The other thing to remember is that if you can't figure this out and you can't seem to make it work, that largest circle, the navy blue circle, is 12 and a half inches in diameter. This one is nine and a half. The tomato red is nine and a half inches in diameter. And these smaller ones easily fit onto an eight and a half by 11 inch sheet of paper. And you should be able to print those just fine. Okay, now the colors that you're going to need for this beautiful block are key lime, ginkgo gold, tomato red, charcoal, aubergine, carnation pink, tide pool, and ink. You are going to cut a base square of the tide pool at 12 and a half inches by 12 and a half inches. Because remember, all of these blocks are 12 and a half inches by 12 and a half inches. So cut out your base square 12 and a half inches by 12 and a half inches. Now you might feel like you need to reinforce this. I used some spray starch and spray starched it very, very well and pressed it. There are many um, products on the market that are uh, something that can reinforce the back. There are ones that are washable. That's what I would suggest. Ones that will wash out, that will dissolve in the wash. And you could put iron-on interfacing on the back, but if you do that, you're going to have a very, very thick block in the very end, and that won't work out quite so well. So try to find a soluble, a water-soluble product that is something that reinforces and gives it some heft, or use some type of fabric starch and starch it very, very well. Now, in the video for block number three, I discuss in depth in very much depth, how to machine and how to hand applique. So you could use either of the techniques that I am showing. Plus there are just a myriad of ones online that if you wanna go and find your favorite technique for applique, go ahead and use that. But we do describe in block number three, in the chapter that says how to machine applique and hand applique. It's at the 25 minute, 40 second mark in that video. That's an important spot to find in block number three, 25 minutes and 40 seconds. Click on that and you can go over my uh, techniques for hand and machine applique. So this is the ink circle. This is the largest circle. This is the 12 and a half inch circle. And it gets applique to the 12 and a half inch tide pool block. And then there are subsequent blocks that get applique after that. Now I want you to show, I wanna show you what I've done what the way that I applique, and I described this in the other videos, is that I basically do a facing and then I cut out the back because the back is going to be too thick if I don't do that. So I'm going to uh, applique by machine. I'm going to, or you could do it by hand, my largest circle to my uh, 12 and a half inch square. Okay, so I have my ink blue circle applique to my 12 and a half inch square. Now this was um, a 12 and a half inch square. And so this diameter of this circle was 12 and a half inches. So once I did my applique technique, I now have quarter inch edges around it entirely the whole way around so that when I stitch these blocks together in a row, we have a quarter inch seam allowance and the circle will come right to that um, right to that that edge. Um, we didn't talk about centering this, but there are lots of techniques for finding the center of your block. You could simply fold it once and fold it again and then press it with the iron and that will give you perfect crosshairs on your 12 and a half inch block. And then when you find the center of your circle by doing the exact same technique, you will be able to center your circle just right on that block. Now I've got my second one. I've got my tomato red. And on the picture of the quilt block, you can see that it is not a bullseye, right? It's not right here in the center. It's not at all. Now it's up to you if you wanna do that. This is your quilt, but that's not how we're doing it on the pattern. What we're doing is we are putting it slightly above that bottom edge of that circle. Now again, this is going to be something where you are, we don't have crosshairs here because this is not a bullseye, 
like the first one, you wanted it right in the center, but this one you don't necessarily want it right in the center. So you're going to lay it down, you're gonna look at it, you're gonna eyeball it, make sure it looks really, really good, like it's in the place that you want it to be. If you're one of those people that doesn't trust your eye or you're really, uh, you really wanna be exact, you could measure in from the side. Now I've got this edge, so here's where my, my center line is for where I, where I creased the um, square. I'm gonna lay it on there. It's about an inch and three eighths. And over here, it's on that center line, it's more than an inch and three eighths. So I could move this over just a little bit and then remeasure. But to me, this looks really good. It looks good to my eye as to where it's placed. And then I'm going to put my pins in it and I'm going to machine applique this. Now, I'm not saying that you can't hand applique these. Hand applique is beautiful. Nothing looks as good as hand applique. Absolutely nothing. But I don't have that kind of luxury of that time. And I don't have uh, a lot of things that I'm waiting for at the at the moment. I'm not going to soccer games or I'm not sitting on a bleachers waiting for somebody to come out of swimming lessons like I was when my kids were little. And I know there's a lot of people that have small children that are wanting to do this quilt. They're very excited. I've gotten lots of great emails and lots of interest. So this is going to be the perfect project for you to take along in your bag and sit and hand applique this. So there's going to be a lot of people hand applicating these, but there's going to be a lot of people machine applicating these as well. So I'm going to go over to the sewing machine and I'm going to machine applique this one down. And then I'm going to go ahead and machine applique my other one, my aubergine circle as well. Okay, so when all the three base circles are sewn on, this is how it should appear. It's personal preference whether you want to separate them by a quarter of an inch or you know where you want to lay these circles, but this is actually how the pattern was designed. And you can, like I said, put them however you'd like. These were appliqued using the blind hem stitch and done by machine, however it would look nice no matter what technique you used. Now we'll move to the English paper piecing section. Now, like I said before, there is a method for doing this, like traditional English paper piecing, which you can bring with you on your lap, or I am going to teach you the method that I used, which is to use the sewing machine to put this next section together. You can see that this has one center larger template, which was printed onto the paper, which is right here. And then it is surrounded by two slightly smaller wedges and then even smaller ones down here. So we are going to cut, well, for a total of six for the six blocks in the quilt. But for the purposes of this video, I'm going to cut one of these. I'm going to cut these two out and I'm going to cut these two out of the paper. Now, when I do this, I'm going to cut them on the cutting line and not on the stitching line. All right, because this isn't going to be done slightly differently than uh, the circles. So we are going to go ahead and cut your templates out of the paper on the cutting lines. Okay, now I have my pieces, my templates cut out from the paper. Now, if you save this, you can see that it says on the top, for English paper piecing, use the solid outer, outer line to trace on the fabric. So you're going to use the solid outer line and you're going to trace uh, the template onto your fabric and then cut those pieces out of your fabric. For English paper piecing, use the inner dotted line to trace on cardstock. All right, so my method that I'm doing that isn't English paper piecing, I'm going to show you that first. We are gonna follow these same directions though. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to trace these pieces onto our fabric, or we're going to use the technique that I used in block three for actually, and in uh, this block two as well, for cutting your fabric out of templates. Okay, so we are going to need a total of six of these, but for the purposes of this video, I'm going to only do one block. So I'm cutting one of these out of key lime. 
So this is my technique. This is how I like to cut templates from fabric. You can either, what it says on the directions, you can either trace this onto your fabric and then cut, or you can put a ruler along the edge of the template. Now I always cut, when I cut my templates out, I always cut just a little bit beyond that black line because I know that when I do this with my rotary cutter, I'm gonna end up shaving off a little bit of that paper. Um, so I, and I don't want my piece getting smaller and smaller with each subsequent cut. Okay, so here I've cut my one template out. And then what I will do is then cut the rest of them out this same way. There's one of this, and there's two of the charcoal, and there is to be two of the carnation pink. Okay, so now I have my fabric pieces all cut out, and I'm gonna put those aside. And now for my technique, which is the machine applique, as opposed to using uh, English paper piecing, I'm going to use good old fashioned freezer paper, okay? So I have to keep in mind that there is a right and a left to these pieces. Uh, you know, there's a piece and a piece reversed. So that's why we've included all of them. So you don't have to do that yourself. You don't have to reverse them because they're, they're, they're not symmetric, okay? They're, they're slightly angled, all right? So, so they're gonna go like this alongside of this. All right, so I have to keep that in mind when I'm tracing these on my tracing paper. So I am going to first do this template here, template E. And I can see through my paper just fine. So I'm going to take, and I only need one of these. So I'm gonna take a pen and my ruler and I'm gonna trace on that dotted line, exactly on that dotted line being careful that this does not shift underneath when I'm moving my ruler. So hold it there with your fingers, don't let it shift. You could probably use a smaller piece of freezer paper than this so that you're not worried about it moving all over the place. All right, so that's the first one. So we're gonna repeat that process and we're going to trace the dotted line of all of these templates. And then we're going to cut them out. Okay, so I've cut these all out of freezer paper. Now remember what I said, you have this piece and then its counterpart, which is reversed, right? So you need two of these because you have two of the charcoal pieces. When you have cut out, after you've traced your um, on the, along the dotted line, after you've traced your pieces onto your freezer paper, you're going to iron them onto uh, your respective pieces. Now, just be careful when you do that, that you have um, the reverse piece, that they're, that they're correct, so that you're not accidentally doing this, all right? You, you, that would not be right. So make sure you're getting them on the correct piece. And that you're centering them one quarter inch inside each. So there has to be a quarter inch here, and there has to be a quarter inch here. And when you get to my age, you're gonna be able to just eyeball that. The younger girls, you guys are newer sores. I shouldn't say younger girls. Newer sewists, I'm sorry to say, you're gonna to have to measure on every single one of these. I'm probably pretty good at eyeballing, so I'm going to go ahead and iron these on to my pieces. And when you do that, like I said, make sure that you have the reverse counterpiece because the peppered cottons do not have a right and wrong side, remember? So don't accidentally do this and iron it, you know, which you can't do because this do the freezer paper does have a right and wrong side. So that's gonna make it a little harder. So that's a good thing. So make sure that you actually do have your reverse pieces, all right? And then you're gonna do the same with the key lime piece. You're going to make sure that you iron it a quarter inch centered. And the same thing with the two pink pieces, carnation pink. 
Something else you might consider doing is, and I'm actually probably going to do that, is take a hole punch and make a punch in the center so that when you go to pick these off, it's going to be a lot easier. Okay, so I've punched tiny little holes in there so that I can grab that with my pin to remove these pieces of freezer paper. I've ironed the freezer paper onto that, onto the fabric, okay? And freezer paper will stick for a little while, but not forever, and it comes off of there very nicely. And you've got to be careful, though, when you remove freezer paper, just like in any type of English paper piecing, you're going to have to be very careful not to stretch the pieces. All right, so this is my main piece that's in the, that goes in the center, according to the pattern. Now, these are the pieces, the charcoal gray, and it, they go alongside the key lime piece. All right, so they're... This is how it eventually ends up looking. So instead of English paper piecing, what we're going to do is we're going to put these right sides together and we're going to pin them. We're going to put them alongside like they're supposed to be, alongside each other, matching our ends down here. Okay, we're not gonna worry about the ends being folded over. We're just matching these and we're going to pin along this edge, and that's going to be our quarter inch seam. And we are going to stop exactly at this point right there. We're going to stop. If you want to backstitch one stitch, that's fine. I'm going to take this over to the sewing machine and show you how this works. Okay, so after I lined that up and, and pinned it, you can see that it's fanning the right direction that these are not equal at the top, they're not supposed to be. They're not supposed to be the same up at the top. And, and I did stop, I stopped stitching right there. All right, so you're gonna stitch from the bottom point all the way up to the edge of this right there. And you're going to stop, you're, you're, not, you're not gonna stitch right across the edge because this needs, you need to be able to fold that down. So you're gonna back stitch one stitch because that's gonna be a stress point. All right, and this is fanning in the right direction. We wanna make sure that it's fanning in the right direction. So let's just sew the other side. Let's just sew this one so you can see. And I did sew this one wrong, so I had some threads here that are gonna be pulled off. Okay, so let me show you how this is sewn on here. So you stitch from this corner down here, match up those bottom pieces. Remember what I said? you. You, th this is going to be sewn into the seam allowance, so you don't need to wrap that or worry about that. That These bottom pieces are going to be sewn into the seam allowance. That hangs off the end into the seam allowance. So you're going to stitch this up alongside. Remember we have this extends beyond this. The green extends beyond the gray. And you're going to be careful not to grab your... Um, freezer paper when you stitch on the machine. Okay, so back stitch one, because that's gonna be a stress point when you're, all right. I'm stitching a quarter inch along here, coming all the way down to the bottom point, staying at a quarter inch. This, this bottom end here, the point, that's going to be off the edge of the, of the bottom base block. So you don't have to worry about wrapping that or anything. Now we're going to do, now they're both, they're fanning out the right direction. We've got quarter inch seam allowances. We've, we've stopped and started at a quarter inch before the edge of the fabric. We did not, and make sure you see that, you don't stitch off the edge of that. You do not stitch off the edge. You start right there at the end of that template. You don't start at the top of the gray fabric because you're going to eventually be, you are going to be ironing that and wrapping it over and then appliquing it. Clip your threads. Now we need to do the pink one. Now we're going to put the pink ones, we make sure they're fanning the right direction. This has to fan out this way and this one fans out this way. Okay, don't mix them up. Make sure you're looking at your pattern for reference, your, your pictures of the block for reference. And we're going to 
put this pink with the right sides together, the template with the gray. All right, and then we're gonna pin it there. We're gonna start at that bottom point. Pinning, we're gonna start pinning at that bottom point. We don't necessarily have to start sewing down there. We can start sewing up here. Quarter inch seam. And we're going to start here. This is where we're starting. We're starting to sew here because that's gonna get folded over that top part. So you're gonna do a little back stitch. Back stitch one. Get your thread out of there. Make sure these other ones are moved away, all right? This is where, like I said before with some of the other videos, we're sewing with somebody with ex lots of sewing experience. We've made all the mistakes there are to make. So not only can we tell you this is how we do it, this is how to do this block, we can tell you about how to avoid mistakes. It's one thing to just know how to sew following a dire directions, but it's another thing to know what's going to happen down the road, what kinds of mistakes are gonna be made with a, a piece like this. When you're doing this technique, these are the mistakes you're going to make. All right, and we can maybe head some of those off. All right, so if these start to come off a little bit because they're freezer paper and you iron them, just kind of try to, you can either go back to the iron and put them back on or hold them steady. Now here's my other pink piece. All right, I'm gonna move this one aside. You could go back, you could go and press it. I'm going to put this right sides together with that bottom point. And I'm going to not worry too, too much about that piece of freezer paper. I don't want to catch that in there. I don't want to catch that in there because if, if you do, it's harder to sew it. We know where everything is now, so that probably could just get, that little bottom piece could probably just get snipped off. But Okay, so don't catch that piece of freezer paper in there. All right. Okay, so now I'm going to stitch quarter inch and I'm gonna stop here, I'm gonna stop there. Do not sew across this, stop there. Stop right on the edge of that template. I'm gonna fold that piece back, piece of that freezer paper template so I don't catch it in there into my sewing. stitch here. All right, now they're all, all the whole fan is put together. All right, this whole fan is now put together. And this is the piece that then gets appliqued onto the circles. Okay, now comes a really critical part, pressing. So I've started this, I've started this process. I'm pressing, you can press these seam allowances over either direction, all right? Um, it's just gonna be a matter to you of what feels the best when you're pressing, all right? So I am pressing them over toward the center, this one anyways. This one happened to fold out nicely. Sometimes it's a question of where the fabric wants to lie. Now this might be a little shaky because I've got my camera attached to my ironing board. Now this is where it gets a little dicey we're going to be folding these edges under and we're going to, you're going to have to actually use either a pin or a wooden skewer and try to get those ends under there. Make sure your iron is hot for this. One of those little mini irons is probably going to be a really good thing for something like this. And we're going to go around the entire piece and we're going to fold all these under, all these edges. Don't worry about this bottom piece, this bottom edge here. That gets sewn into the seam allowance, but these edges here, they have to be turned under, all right? So these edges all the way around, this is where that freezer paper comes in. These edges all the way around, 
have to make it more central in the camera here. These edges all the way around have to be folded under. Now, if you wanted to use a little fabric glue at this point to help you, you could do that. There's lots of different techniques that you can use to accomplish the same end. That's what we would be doing with um, English paper piecing would be to use a little fabric glue. This is gonna be important, this little piece right there when we get to the sewing machine. And I'm gonna show you some tips for that. But then you're going to continue to go all the way around, sewing the, or ironing those edges under. Or you could even just, but I'm gonna do this by, sew, by machine, but you could at this point now do this and then hand applique this down. So there's another technique that you could use. You could hand applique this down. I'm just gonna to continue to iron all these edges down because I'm gonna applique this by sewing, by, on my sewing machine. That's what I did for the entire quilt. I applique the whole thing down with my sewing machine. Okay, so I'm gonna go all the way around. You don't need to watch me press this whole entire thing, but I'm going to go all the way around and press all these edges in. Okay, I've got my ends ironed under, and I'm not gonna to lie to you, this is gonna be tricky, okay? So the most important part now at this point is to, and you can see these, these edges are, are ironed, but they're still popping out a little bit. Um, you, the most important point at this point now is to make sure that this is centered because you don't want to get it all sewn on and then find out that it's not centered. So we're going to pull it down because remember I said that this edge goes off the edge. All right, so find that center point that you marked before, which is right here on my block when you made the little um, crosshairs where you made the center. So this was the center right here. I can see where I creased it. Right there was where I creased it. If it didn't, if it's not showing up now, make sure you recrease that and find that center. All right. And then up here is my center. So I'm going to give an eye to that lining up to the center of this green, the center of my green. So, okay, up here is my center here. So the center of my key lime piece is going to be here. I've got to make sure that I have this centered because if this is not centered and you go and sew it on, it's it, you're going to have to rip it off and start over. All right, so I'm going to put a pin up here and look to these as well. Look to these sides with your aubergine that it looks like it's centered here. Now, at this point, like I said, you could um, you could also just hand applique this, but remember, I still have to remove my I still have to remove my freezer paper now without without stretching my pieces all to smithereens here. I did poke a little hole there to help with pulling them out, but I'm not having any trouble pulling these out, so. Let me just take this pin off here. There if there's just a little bit left behind, no big deal. All right. Now, like I said, not going to lie to you, this is going to be tricky. But it's still going to be faster than English paper piecing. But if you're not into speed and you don't care, then we're gonna do the next step as English paper piecing. So what you're doing here is you're going to either hand applique now or machine applique this down. This is why we didn't sew all the way to the edge with these gray pieces, remember? We stayed, we stopped at that quarter inch seam because we're turning these under, we're needle turning or we're just using our skewer and ironing and turning all three of these simultaneous actions and turning it under and then that's where we're going to stitch and then afterwards we're going to clip away all those little threads so we're going to make sure that this is centered well too all right turning it under up here and then this up here along the edge of the key lime that has to get turned under too
right. So I can choose to either hand applique this or go back to my sewing machine and use the technique of the blind hem, which is what I've been using all over the whole rest of the, the block and the rest of the quilt. Turn those under, turn those edges under. Don't worry about these threads, we can clip them later. There we go. And we're gonna go all the way around turn all these edges under. This wooden skewer is very helpful for pushing these edges under, turning these edges under, not only just while you're sewing, but also while you're pinning. Little applique pins would be good here too. So now you may go ahead and hand applique this or machine applique this on. Going to continue to pin. There we go. Now, I don't know if I've saved myself any time. If sewing it by hand with English paper piecing would have been faster, it's just not my, not my gig, so. This is how I choose to do these. If you English paper piece these, you're still going to end up appliquing these on. So when you English paper piece, you're still going to end up putting them onto here and appliquing. So you're going to end up with the same result. All right, now I'm going to go to the machine and tuck as I stitch. Okay, now you can see how it is going. I used a neutral colored thread. That's the downside to having, you would have to change your thread every single time and you'd have more threads to clip along the edges. So the downside to doing this by, so by machine is that you're going to use, need to use a neutral colored thread when you stitch this down. But look how nice it does look, stitched down after I ironed it with the edges around the freezer paper. It really works nicely. Like I said, no matter what you do, whether you English paper, paper piece this, sorry about the blurriness, or whether you um, stitch it by machine like I did, if you stitch these, this fan together by machine, you're still going to end up having to applique this down in some way, shape, or form. And for those of you that love to have something in your lap, this is a perfect, perfect block for you. So here we have it all appliqued on. And last but not least, we're going to put the circle of ginkgo gold that's going to be appliqued at the top. And that, of course, you're going to follow the directions from block three at um, marker chapter 25 minutes, uh, how to machine applique and hand applique, which is the chapter that it's in on the YouTube video, again, for block three. This piece here, you can see that this is hanging down. This gets stitched across. You didn't need to worry about that raw edge down there on the bottom because that's inside the quarter inch seam. So the next thing we're going to do is talk about just how would we do this if this was um, English paper piecing as opposed to the way that I did it by machine, putting it together with the freezer paper. Well, the first thing again that you're going to do is you're going to print the template pieces onto cardstock. So just regular cardstock that you can get at any paper store, Staples, Office Max, Office Depot, any of those office supply stores, probably even, you know, Target or Walmart, and put them, print them right off onto your cardstock. Again, the same things apply where you are going to make sure that you have the one inch square cut to scale. This whole thing's been upside down this whole time. This one inch square is supposed to be scale so that you know that you've got the right size for these. Then we're going to cut these out and proceed from there. Okay, when you initially do the English paper piecing uh, templates that are now printed on cardstock, I used my 
rotary cutter and ruler to cut them in the procedure that I had explained earlier in the video. And you're going to cut the fabric along the cutting lines. But then when you go to use these templates for the actual English paper piecing, you're going to cut them down along the dotted line because those are the pieces that the fabric is going to be wrapped around. Make certain that you have them laid out in the right directions so that when you go to put your cardstock inside of your pieces of fabric, that you have mirror image pieces. So you can decide to either keep the printed side of the cardboard against the fabric or the opposite, just so long as these and these remain mirror image. It won't matter with this one because it is a symmetrical piece. So then go ahead and cut your cardboard templates down along the dotted lines. So we're here with Nancy Wazalik because she is the expert paper piecer here. And I've just explained before that I'm not very much of an expert at this. So I'm turning it over to somebody that is. It's really important when you do your sewing and quilting and you're looking up things on YouTube to find people that are very experienced. It's one thing to do a video and show somebody how to do something. It's yet another to have somebody present a video that does it all the time because they are going to be able to point out to you what kinds of things work and what don't. So if you don't have a lot of experience in, in doing a particular procedure or technique, you really need to seek out somebody that does have a lot of experience. So Nancy has pointed out to me um, several things that might be a little bit tricky when you English paper piece these pieces. We've discussed prior how you do it by machine. And, um, we talked about in the video right before this, keeping your printed side up consistently because this one is symmetric, but these pieces are not symmetric, okay? So um, it's important to be consistent about keeping those pieces, those printed uh, cardboard pieces, you know, either always have the print side up or always have the print side down on your fabric. All right, so, Nancy, why don't you talk to us about how you think that the best way is to actually do the, the English paper piecing with these kinds of pieces. Okay, the, first let me tell you what I'm using. I'm using a little um, a glue pen from Sewline, and it has these little, um, little refillable cartridges here of this glue, so you, it's refillable. And this is what I've been using for quite a long time. I tried the sewing method of sewing the fabric onto the template, but this is a lot faster. Um, one thing I like to do is I put a little dab of glue on the back, just a little tiny bit of the template, especially when you have a piece that's, that's longer than this, it just kind of helps you hold it down onto plate, onto its place. And I would think that would be good too, because not everybody gets done at the same amount of time you're going to have to make dinner or whatever you set it right. aside you don't want it moving around and getting right. away from you yeah. right um and it just kind of helps you keep your or your seam lines or your fold over lines um consist um consistent mm -hmm. um when you place your glue you don't want to use a whole lot it's just a light touch and you don't want to put glue right next to the to the edge of the template because that's where you're going to be sewing um so you're just gonna do kind of a light swipe of the glue. Um, and I'm going a little bit farther out from the seam line. And then you just fold it over. And then we'll do this section here. Now this is a really um, pointy piece here and you wanna make sure that you're getting this fabric glued down now here you're probably going to have to just put glue on the whole thing. But you want to make sure that this is glued right next to the template. And then that end, as we've said before in my prior video, that goes into the seam allowance. So that that end right here doesn't, it, I guess it's okay if that's not yeah. totally tucked. Because then when you're coming around the next side and you put your glue down, then you're going to fold this over again. 
this is just gonna have to kind of oh i see you put glue right on the fabric yeah oh that's excellent so you can do it that way you could probably trim this a little bit too if you wanted to you don't want to trim too much away right um but i'm gonna trim just a little bit to make it a little bit easier to see but the main thing is to make sure that you have the fabric tight onto the template and so you get that nice um, crisp point there. Perfect. So we're going to fold that over and keep going. Now my guess is that that sew line glue doesn't stick as hard as Elmer's glue stick. I could see that it would be really tempting to somebody to grab an Elmer's glue stick. It would be for me because I've got that in my drawer, you know. So um, Yeah, and I just find that um, I did try the Elmer's glue stick. It's a lot stickier. Um, it's harder to release the fabric once you're finished. Okay. And I found um, usually I wait a while. Well, I, I don't know. Um, the project that I'm working on has a quite a few pieces. It's a grandmother's flower garden. And so when I come back to a point where I'm going to remove the paper, the glue has dried somewhat and it's easy to get the paper out. Oh, good. Um, That's good to hear. Now, if you were going to try to do that right away here, it, it would probably be harder. Okay. So I'm just going to turn this around and you can see that we've got it oh, yes. glued. Very nice. Um, tightly to the template. And you really don't need to worry much about what's going on back here. Right. Because when you sew them together, that's just going to be in the seam line. Right, and it's all going to get applicated down. Right. Yep. And then we'll just go ahead and do the bottom part here. And I always push, um, I push with my thumbnail. Because you just, you want to, because if you're not accurate with your gluing, and again, don't worry about these little Daughters, corners here. Yeah. Because they're going to be taken care of once you get the sewing down. Yeah, and I when I applicate the other ones on using a different the, the other technique, the first technique we showed for putting those together, um, I go through how to applique it onto the block in such a way with using a wooden skewer that oh, just okay. kind of turns almost like a needle turn type technique that pushes it all under. Okay, so we'll do this big. Again, I'm going to put just a little, a few little dots of glue on the back, probably especially that point of there to keep it down. Okay, and then we'll, once you're done with that, we will talk about how to stitch them together. Okay. Okay. All right, we've got these two pieces um, ready to sew. Um, and um, so we're going to put them right sides together. And... Um, you just, the one thing you want to make sure of is that you match these bottom points. Right, because they're, they're, they're offset at the top because it looks like, like that. It looks like it's fanned out. Yeah. So we match them at the bottom. And the yep. bottom does get sewn into the seam allowance. Um, what kind of needle do you use, Nancy? Um, I, I've tried different kinds of needles. Um, I like a thinner needle. Um, this is a Milner needle. They're long and kind of um, straight. Um, they have a fairly small eye. They're a little bit difficult to thread, but it's really a, your own preference. Um, I like a smaller needle just because you want to take fairly fine stitches on the edge so they don't show through to the front. That's right, and I would guess too if you needed if you used a thicker needle, wouldn't it be more a possibility that you'd puncture that um, cardboard and you'd include yes. the cardboard in your stitch? So you might need a much much finer needle. Yeah. Okay. Because you you really don't want to sew into the cardboard. Right. All right. What I'm going to do is, and if you can see this, I'm going to come underneath here, and I'm going to go into the seam, and I'm going to come up right at the tip of the template. Okay. I'm going to open this up just a little bit so I can see where it is. Okay, there it is. It's right. And you hide your knot that way. Yep, and then your knot is hidden. So it's right there. So I come up right at the tip of the All right, this thread is a little bit too long. 
If you have your thread too long, it's going to start knotting on you. Long thread, lazy girl, right? <laughs> There's an old German saying, I have but not I don't heard know. that. Oh, yeah. Crystal says that all the time. This woman that we knit with, she's saying that. It's long thread, like lazy girl. The lazy man's load when you try to carry too much. Mm -hmm. All right, and then I'm going to match it up. Again, I'm going to make sure that I'm on the right spot here. And I'm going to match it up. And I'm going to feel for that, the tip of the template. Okay. And I will line those up. And I, I stick my tongue out when I sew. <laughs> Just like a little kid concentrating uh -huh. on her coloring. Make sure again that I get that lined up. And I did bring out one of my little clips here. Um, just because these are long pieces. Oh, that's a great idea. Just to hold it together. All this, right. Yeah, this is different than EPP with um, hexagons. It's a much longer, thinner piece. Exactly. Um, it just kind of makes it easier to hold that. All right. So I'm at the tip here, and I'm just going to take, you just want to grab the barest amount You know, even just a thread or two in your fabric. And I like to make a little buttonhole stitch. So I leave a little bit of a loop and then I come back through. Oh. And really? then I pull that and that kind of tightens the end of it. Is that just for, is that only on the first stitch or you do it with every stitch? Just the first stitch. Okay. I think I've seen people do it on every stitch, but. And then I make another stitch that's pretty close to it. You just want to make sure that that end, the end of any, I'll see here, I've got a knot. That the beginning of every seam is secure, so it's not going to come undone. Let me see if I can get this knot out here. Hmm. I heard it. It sounded like it popped out. No, it's still in there. All right, I'm going to rethread this. Okay, we're back. And we're just gonna continue. I make very small stitches very close together. So it would be almost close to a sewing machine stitch. Um, so oh, so probably you don't cr crisscross them? Nope. Okay. Um, probably about a 16th of an inch. What an excellent project to take with you on your lap if you wanted to visit with friends because you can't you can't do this with knitting because you can't talk to people while you're knitting because you're counting. <laughs> this you could take with you on your lap and still have conversation. My project that I'm working on now, my only one and only EPP project, has gone everywhere that I've flown because you can put a little packet, a little zippy bag on in your purse and work on it anywhere. That is true. And I provided the sewing machine alternative for those of us that <laughs> prefer to sew this kind of thing on machine, so. And I am feeling with my needle to make sure that I am staying on top ah. of the um, template. Okay, so you're not, in, you're not engaging the template. No, no engagement with the template. <laughs> Words to live by. Every once in a while, you'll kind of sew through the edge, but it's not that big of a deal. I don't know if you can see here what I'm doing. Yep, we can see really well. Okay, just and take a tiny. The um. So then we're going to reiterate that she said we should leave that glue dry. Do not uh, go that same day or night or whatever. Just let it dry for a little bit so that it's mm -hmm. easier to pull out that template. And you won't remove the paper until you have all sides sewn. Um, you want to make sure that all sides are sewn. Mm -hmm. Now this okay. one, let's see, is that the, yeah, this one you would that's have to. That's the end one. That's the mm -hmm. end one. So you'll have to um, take it out from underneath, I guess, after you applique it on or. Or take it out before Or applique. take it out, you mm -hmm. know, make sure that's ironed down well. Correct. So I'm going to open this up. And the goal is to not to see um, 
any of the stitches. Oh, you can see here. I mean, you can see a little bit because it's black, which I wouldn't, mm. I would use a more. It's beautiful. Um, so you just continue to do that all the way You just continue. Up. Now, when you get to the end, again, I would make a few stitches close together and then do that buttonhole stitch right, knot right. to hold that securely down. Um, and then you're done and you just continue with your doing the green one doing the green one and then um really you could do sew them in any order i mm -hmm. guess that's true um, you know and then continue your fan and then we we talked about how you will eventually then go and applique this in your preferred method so that it does get applique on so that it looks like this i used the um blind hem stitch on my sewing machine, or you could just use regular applique. And it would be fairly simple at this point to applique it down because she did do such a good job of pressing these down like so. So you really won't have any trouble keeping those ends under. Well, thank you, Nancy. You You're certainly welcome. are an expert at uh, well, English paper piecing. I appreciate that. I, I, um, I enjoy handwork a lot. So that concludes block four. I think this is going to be one of the most fun ones to make out of all the blocks. I love all of them, but this one kind of stands alone, stands on its own. And it will be one that I think will be used for throw pillows, um, might be repeated as an entire quilt. Who knows? But I hope you enjoyed this and I hope it gave you some insight on how to put this wonderful block together.